Hi. There's a, there's a little bit of delay. So, yeah, no problem. So Satya and Theodore has one thing in common. Uh, Satya being the youngest in the world to do seven summits as well as seven volcanic summits. And Theodore is the person uh, who is the oldest in the world to do you know, uh, seven summits as well as seven volcanic summits. And we have James Stone as well. Hi. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks Dipanjan for the introduction. And uh, uh, hi, James. Hi, Ted. How are you doing? Hey, hi, Tajan. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we are. Uh, uh, we already see a lot of people are watching this live. So thank you, everyone for watching this live and uh, uh, let the comments go on and you can ask your questions and uh, uh, Dipanjan will ensure that uh, the question which is to us and we will uh, uh, put those questions. And uh, uh, like, you know, we already see uh, some comments and we are just showing it. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel has uh, wished me happy birthday. Thanks. And I see a lot of people as well uh, who uh, wish the birthday wishes. Yeah, so thanks Dipanjan for the ho uh, hosting this and uh, we will uh, 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 just keep you in the backstage for the time being and then we'll again bring you for the question and answer sessions. All right. Yeah. Yes. So here is Ted. Ted, uh, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. It's morning time with three continents. Isn't that fantastic? It's morning time in here, evening where you are, and of course, uh, afternoon where James is. That's super. Happy birthday. I don't know if we're going to do it officially. How are we going to do that? But uh, um, <laughs> you're, uh, you're, what, are you, what are you, 37, 38, 38? No, I just become 37. <laughs> 37. My God, yeah. you have so much climbing in front of you. You lucky guy. Uh, like, you know, uh, so I'm looking forward and I'm trying to get inspiration from you both uh, because uh, Ted, those who don't know Ted, Ted is the oldest, and I would say youngest, in fact, youngest in the mind, uh, oldest person in the world to climb the highest mountains of all the seven continents, which is called seven summits, and the highest volcanoes of all the seven continents uh, called uh, volcanic seven summits. And uh, Ted did it at the age of 71 years and uh, how many days was it, Ted? 235. 235. And uh, he completed this feat on 18th uh, December 2019, right? I think it was the 9th, the 9th of December two, uh, 2018, yeah. Wow. And at the age of uh, 71 years, can you imagine, guys? Like, you know, so I think this is a, a real inspiration and age is just a number in front of uh, a Ted. So Ted, we'll come back to you again. Uh, and James, uh, James, uh, uh, James is the first per person from... Uh, uh, he's the first British to climb all the seven volcanic summits, and uh, and he has diverse experience in different different uh, mountains in Guatemala and in uh, other parts of the world, which we will be uh, hearing from James. And uh, yeah, welcome, James. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, and uh, may I give you my uh, best wishes for your birthday as well. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah so I came to um, worldwide high altitude mountaineering a bit late in life. I've spent many, many years tramping around the British Hills, um, and um, we learned from that that the height of hills doesn't actually matter that much at the end of the day, uh, because it all gives you experience. Um, but yes, the, um, the, the the volcanic seven summits gave me a particular challenge to go for, and. Um, enable me to travel around the world and uh, it's a great experience right and uh, so uh, ted you also became the first uh, north american to climb all these and you I, I think you are the 10th no ninth person in the whole world to have achieved this feat and i don't know whether i'm the 10th uh, because you did on 18th say uh, 19th you said no 19th uh, 19th december and no, the, the ninth. Well, the ninth of December is when I did uh, ho, uh, uh, Ojo Cesalado. and um, right. is that what you mean? The the last yes. month of them, yeah. The ninth yeah. of December, uh, two thousand eighteen. I did the. Uh, I I 
I finally got Ojo de Salado in, uh, in the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile on the Argenti Argenti right. uh, Chile Argentinian border. Yeah. Right. So I completed it on uh, January uh, 16th, 15th January, uh, the thing. So between you and me, I don't know whether was there any other person who completed the seven summits and seven volcanic summits uh, in that uh, duration, uh, less than one month. Uh, but if that is not so, then uh, after you, I think uh, I am the 10th person uh, and I got to know from you just a few days back, like, you know, so I'm the 10th person in the world. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, which one, uh, uh, like, you know, James, the question is to you that uh, which out of the seven volcanic summits uh, uh, you find you found it pretty um, interesting? Um, well, they're all interesting. That's a very difficult question to answer because they are all interesting in their different ways uh, in terms uh -huh. of the landscapes and the cultures and so forth that you in, in, encounter. Uh, I mean, physically, uh, it's uh, there's little doubt that. Um, that's uh, the Papua New Guinean one and uh, Kilimanjaro in uh, Tanzania are probably the easier ones, but uh, e each of those, so the, the, the ease of the ascent was counted by the cultural experience that one gets in yeah. each, uh, uh, for each of those mountains. Um, so, uh, it's a bit, that question is a bit like uh, um, somebody asking you, which is your favorite child? That's uh, so <laughs> slightly unfair. Um, <laughs> and uh, almost impossible to answer uh, because they, they all have their good bits to them. <laughs> you know, I, I found I found Bolui uh, to be a really wonderful mountain. I guess it was my personal experience because of the guys I was with, the, the Papuan guys I was with. But they, you know, I ended up getting to the mountain without any food, by, it just happened that way. And they shared me and, we, and it was in the pouring rain when we got to the bottom of the mountain. And uh, within about an hour, we had a fire going. We had a fire pulling over over our heads. We were we were soaked, but feeling really cool. And and uh, then they uh, threw some uh, you know those potatoes uh, in the fire and uh, yeah. a few other things. And I don't know. Within a, an hour, it was just such a special experience. So like every mountain, even if it's not the most difficult, can have a lot of uh, really special you know things going. You know, special special. Things going on, you know, the character of it, like kind of the excitement and so forth. So, uh, of course, the bigger mountains are the ones that, you know, you guess um, feel, um, um, you know, kind of uh, achievement. But on the smaller mountains, you can feel something really special for, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the, the cultural experience, just as you said, James. Right. So, at you, seven, how, yeah, what was your favorite mountain? Okay, so uh, I, I think I, I resonate with uh, James uh, when I say, like, you know, so I mean, like, all the mountains are so different in nature and everything uh, offers a totally different culture, a totally different kind of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, like, you know, even Kilimanjaro has its own challenge, uh, own beauty, uh, and uh, so is uh, Mount Sidley, and so is Ohos. Like, you know, so uh, I found Ohos to be a pretty um, standard mountain, like, you know, pretty, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, descent, high altitude mountain uh, compared to all the mountains. And um, Sydney, it was uh, amazing, like, you know, when, yeah. and when I got to know from James before I was going for that, and uh, uh, we had a lot of discussions among ourselves, and uh, to walk in certain places where you know that you were the first person in the world yeah. to walk on those roads and we took a different route altogether. Uh, yeah. so it was yeah. like as if Neil Armstrong is <laughs> taking that one step, uh, like, you know, and one, one giant step to mankind. So for me, it was like one giant step for myself. Like, you know, so, and uh, it, it was, it was very, very unique. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but tell me, Ted, uh, what is the motivation? Uh, that keeps you ticking at the age of 71 and where people retire at the age of 60 in India. Uh, and you at age of 70, you won. You were like, uh, and yesterday when I was talking to you, day for yesterday, you had more and more plans coming up. What is the secret? And what do you want to tell to the audience here like, who are watching you? You know, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny one. Um, I guess some people think I'm crazy, but I just love life, you know, I just love to be out there and do things and achieve things. That's how I feel. 
like I'm I'm alive and uh, um, physically I you know I train I I don't think age, I don't think really age is a factor there as long as you keep yourself in good shape and you you have a you know a reasonably good diet and and so forth so it's about keeping your spirit up and you know your love of life and um, uh, and your your need to um, keep um, you know poking yourself to see you know what you got in you and and so forth so just you know i guess always having a, a goal a dream um, um always wanting um to experience life um to its fullest you know i mean i've had that sort of uh, thing in me all my life i think it's a bit about being a, a kind of a blank canvas open to opportunities that come along that uh, when you see something and it's and it feels right then go for it just just make it part of you you know um um try it i mean if you uh, all you can do is fail and if you fail you just you know you uh, get back up and um start over again or you move on to something else uh, um but just just go out there and and um because we only have one life so don't miss opportunities that come your way awesome that is quite inspiring uh, and uh, your obvious question goes to james as well you know so yeah well i've already mentioned uh, the the question of the, the the cultures that you come across um the different landscapes at school i was always in geography and so forth so knitted into that i was lucky enough as a child to uh, be taken around um the world by my parents so i had early experience age about six of the Canadian Rockies and uh, a little bit later of the New Zealand Alps. And uh, that's probably where the seed was uh, set, so far as I'm concerned. It took quite a long time to germinate and sprout into anything. Uh, I, I still remember vividly uh, the white cat peaks, and um, I probably at that point I didn't think that people bothered climbing them. And if so, what was the point? Um, but one, one soon uh, even when one, one's wander, wandering around the, um, the hills and mountains of the British Isles that uh, you do uh, um, get, get benefits from your mental well-being um, and it provides a degree of release from the pressures of life as we have it today in, uh, in mm -hmm. the world. And um, tra travel, understanding different cultures, uh, gives you broader understanding of what's going on in the world as well um, and I think it, it's a well-worn well, well -worn phrase that travel broadens the mind uh, mm. I truly believe that it, it does and it, it is most important in the world today to see uh, other people's perspectives on the world um, and that engenders greater understanding and tolerance and so forth which I feel is lacking yes. in, in many regards yeah. Um, and not only is there the mental fitness, but of course there's the, uh, the, the physical fitness. Um, yes, keep the old, older ones like myself and Ted going and doing the sort of things we're doing. You know, when I started the, um, the, the Volcanic Seven Summits, um, I was uh, 54. So, you know, it's never oh. too, too late in life to, um, to, to, to you know, adopt these challenges and, and go for it. And as Ted said, says, why not? And if you fail, then you, you learn from from that and you get better and um, you get better mentally, you get better physically. Um, and um, that there is, you know, that there is, there is the challenge. And um, as, as I think we've discussed before, it's a bit like uh, a, a metaphor for life. Yeah. That, um, you know, it, 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 the, the mountaineering experience, you, you start as I did when I was a child looking at these things and thinking, well, um, nobody goes up there, surely. And then you find out, um, having gone through various stages of climbing the small hills, getting the experience, being led by guides, then not needing guides, guiding other people up mountains. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's a step-by-step -step thing. You don't go from looking at the mountains to being at their summits. You, yeah. you get that experience and uh, eventually you feel confident in yourself um, and it's all about self-development you apply that to your your, your work you, you join perhaps as an office junior you don't expect to be the chief executive the next day uh, you build that experience and teamwork and understanding and yeah 
communication skills and all that in the same way as you've the mountaineering skills when you get to um, yeah. to a peak that you are satisfied with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, all that is, is relevant and then you can impart all that experience to others and that in itself uh, I find pleasure in. Awesome. So here is a question from the audience. Uh, this mm -hmm. is for Ted. What inspired him? What inspired him to take up this challenge? There were two different. There were a few different challenges there. Uh, the initial challenge of climbing the seven summits, uh, which I completed in 2014, it began in 2006, and it wasn't really a challenge when I began it uh, to climb the seven summits. It was more just I wanted to uh, climb Aconcagua in South America, highest mountain. And um, I had it in my mind for a few years, and I had been climbing other stuff in South America, and suddenly it was the biggest one, so why don't I go give it a shot? Uh, and I was um, amazed, I was just amazed that I succeeded. It wasn't, I, you know, it wasn't easy, and um, uh, carrying a, you know, a 50-pound pack on my back up that mountain, uh, well, at the beginning, you know, when you have to cash back and forth. So when I succeeded, um, uh, I felt pretty good, and the next year I decided, hey, why don't I try uh, uh, Mount Denali in Alaska? So um, I organized myself in 2007 to attempt that one, and um, although we were 23 days in the mountain, um, and it didn't look very good for a while because the weather was so bad, uh, we were really early in the season, early May, uh, the team above us, uh, the one team that was before us, um, the, the, the very first team on the mountain, they were Italian, and they were really, they were stuck up at camp four. They, some, of them, some of them lost their fingers and toes, and we were just down below them in camp three. Um, but the weather changed, and uh, we had a shot at it. Uh, a couple of us made it to the summit. Um, it was, it was a, just a fantastic experience, and that sort of grew into a challenge. Then I realized, well, wait a minute now. Uh, uh, well, when I was, it's kind of a story here, but when I was, um, on the uh, 21, I went off to, um, I hitchhiked around the world. I found myself in the Himalayas that I wanted to do, and I uh, decided to go up in the mountains. That's a story by itself. But, but so, you know, it kind of de developed. And then I said, well, why don't I go and try um, uh, to climb uh, Choyo Yu in, in uh, Tibet, uh, the sixth highest mountain in the world. It's not one of the seven, but I wanted to see how I would do. And so it gradually became a, a challenge. And finally, I finished that one uh, in 2014, the seven highest mountains, uh, well, the, se the highest mountain in every continent. And then when I turned, uh, so the good, I guess the good part of the, the uh, question uh, here, or the good part of the answer is, uh, I needed when I, I was about 68 when I finished the seven summits. And um, when I was turning 70, I said to myself, you know, I, I need, I mean, I can't, I just can't go into my seventh decade with, you know, without having a, a big challenge uh, or something to do. So I decided to attempt to climb the seven summits in one year. I didn't succeed. I had uh, six of them done in the first uh, eight and a half months. But uh, as, uh, as as you guys know, uh, O House uh, turned me back a couple of times uh, because of bad weather and so forth. So I, I finally got it done in about 18 months. But so it wasn't, um, it was about a year and a half. But I don't know, I just needed something when I turned 70 that I that I knew I was still kicking and still had something left in me. And uh, that's it, that's the, that's the story. That's how, that's yeah. why I do it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have a question from Mark, but we'll take that question after we uh, uh, first go to store, uh, James first. So James, uh, now that you have done all the seven summits and uh, like you know, all the seven volcanic summits, uh, what what is your next plan? And uh, can you share some of your experiences? Okay, yeah. So well, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, I've been fortunate enough to to travel around the world and to climb mountains uh, on every uh, continent, um, and other than that, uh, many mountains on every continent, um, and uh, the. Uh, Yes, people go for the highest and why not highest on every continent. Um, but uh, mountains aren't necessarily just about height. Um, because if you're looking for the highest, then you have to go to Asia. Um, and if you're looking for me for a wider experience, 
Um, particularly the cultural one, I keep on going on about that, but that is of great interest to me. Um, then uh, you, you need to, to look to other, other places. And, the, and uh, traditionally, the classification of mountains has all, been all the right, so the, the highest in the world, the highest in the, co on the various continents, the highest for each country, um, and so forth. Uh, but there's another Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, we lost James, uh, but yeah, while we get, get him back, I think he's... Back now, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in, in, yeah, so in, instead of absolute height, uh, you can have to look at something called relative height, because how, how much uh, does a mountain stand above its, um, its surrounding landscape? And this is the concept of prominence. Uh, so how much drop is there needed off a particular mountain top or you uh, are able to go up to a high, higher peak. Um, and you can have various classifications of prominence and the particular ones I'm looking at now are ultra prominent peaks, so shortened temperatures. And these are peaks that have at least 1,500 meters of prominence. And they're scattered around the world. And um, it's easy to remember how many there are in the world in that there are just over 1,500 of them to match the 1,500 meters of prominence. Uh, and, yeah, as I say, they're scattered around the world uh, and the three countries have, have the most of China, USA and Canada. Um, and uh, there's a small but growing group of people who look to, to, to climb these mountains um, and you know, they're going to climb them all. Uh, and the person who's climbed the most, in fact, is uh, about 300 under his belt. Um, so that, that's what I'm looking at the moment. Gives me an excuse again for the for the for the travel. Um, I'll be able to indulge in that once this uh, dread, dreaded pandemic is is out of the way. Um, so so you know, if people are interested in in the concept of up to high mountains, which are sort of world class mountains in a different sense, then I can um, point. People, perhaps not by way of links uh, on the Facebook feed, and we've got the uh, my website that also has some information on the top 50 most prominent mountains in the world, and those who I have been able to ascertain have have climbed um, many of them. We've climbed all 50. There's another challenge for uh, somebody to pick up, um, and um, there are links in that. Um, yeah, so this is your website. Uh, yeah. This is the website that uh, James uh, manages, and uh, he is the custodian for the Volcanic Seven Summits. So whoever uh, like, you know, he finds out from all over the world who has done it, and he and he updates that list. And he, this is his uh, website. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, maybe Dipanjanda, if you can post that website in the post, uh, Facebook post. So James is talking about the top fifty ultras of the world, and uh, it is a great challenge and. Interestingly, the highest mountains need not to be the in this list uh, of top 50 ultras of the world. And there are 1,500 ultras uh, in in the whole world, I think. Right, James? So just over, yes, just over. Yeah. Right. And uh, interestingly, in the South India, there are two mountains: one in Kochi and one is in uh, uh, I think uh, um, near Tiruvannathapuram or someplace. Coimbatore. Coimbatore. Yeah. I was not aware, and uh, I think this is a very good challenge for uh, the upcoming mountaineers. Uh, and if you want to just uh, uh, like go and experience uh, based on some list, if you don't know which mountains you want to go and climb, you can choose your mountains from this 1500 uh, list of mountains. So there are mountains and mountains, and uh, I was just calculating that if I do one mountain every day, <laughs> so it's like 1500 days, like five years. <laughs> that's a that's a lot of mountains actually. So. Uh, uh, but here is the website, and uh, yeah, uh, so it was a very, very nice uh, information, James. And uh, definitely, I'm sure the audience will uh, have a look, and it will be fascinating to see someone finish all the 50. Is there anyone who has done all the 50? No, there's nobody. The, the, the nearest is about 36, I think. But wow. the, and I stand at 11. Both Ted and me stand at 11. Uh, how many are you there, James? I'm, I'm on 10. Oh wow. <laughs> wow! So, 
So James uh, was supposed to go to South America, uh, and even I was contemplating to go and meet him. Uh, but due to COVID situation, we had to change our plans, and uh, um, uh, so hopefully very soon we'll go there. So one question from Nila Vishek. Uh, I think Nila Vishek is uh, uh, another mountaineer from India, and he is um, almost there for the seven volcanic summits. Uh, so he uh, wrote that. Uh, uh, we spoke briefly with you in uh, Facebook and waiting for him to be in Germany. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you have any message for Nila Vishik? Well, yes. Uh, uh, well, my son is still living in Cologne, so uh, at some point when uh, we're able to travel, we'll be going across. We originally planned to go across uh, probably in uh, May or June, but uh, it's not happening now, so it'll be later in the year. So, awesome. in Right. So, uh, yeah, it is uh, 10 years for your Everest Summit, Ted. Congratulations. And uh, uh, and those of you who don't know, Ted has just come up with an amazing, amazing book. And that book, you can find it out more details at uh, daretoreach.ca. Uh, daretoreach.ca. And uh, let me see if I can um, open and show you uh, the cover of that book. And yes, this is the cover of the book, and uh, it's amazing pictures. And uh, in YouTube, there are certain pictures, certain videos of uh, Ted, which is um, uh, certain videos uh, of uh, the Kumbu Ice Fall, and the most famous one I think, which has a million views, is that that of Ted. So, Ted, uh, uh, would you want to answer this question uh, about your experience on Everest? It was a, well, I turned 63 on Everest, actually. Um, at, um, it was a, you know, great experience, of course. You know, you spend, uh, it was 60, it's a 65 day, well, 65 day altogether, uh, living on rock and ice for over 50 days, uh, well, 55 days or more. Um, it really does test you. You have to know why you're there. It seems rather obvious to know why you're there, but it's not obvious. And you guys, you know, sure, have, sure know about that. That uh, there's a lot of people who, who would like to do something, but uh, going and doing it and hanging in there and um, it's a different story. Um, it uh, was a, a turning point, I guess, uh, in my my life. Not sort of um, it didn't change anything really, but it changed something inside of me that realizing that I could uh, take on, uh, you know, a very big challenge uh, and hang in there and, and make it happen. Uh, and up until the very end, you never know if you're going to succeed or not succeed. So you really believe you have to believe in yourself. And that, I think, is about any of these mountains, just going out there and the smallest, start small, like James said, you know, start small, a step at a time, and one little step at a time will uh, get you to the summit, whether you're climbing a mountain or anything you're doing in life. That's been my experience. I'm an entrepreneur and I have started at the bottom, really, really at the bottom. And um, one step at a time, uh, believing in what I was doing, going through hard times, uh, like you do on a mountain, but you do also in business and you do in life. And so it's all about one step at a time. It's all about believing in what you're, uh, who you are and what you're doing. Um, on Everest, um, it was, um, um, you know, it, it was um, a growing experience. It was um, uh, kind of a personal summit of, um, in psychologically, um, and it was a lot of different things. So yes, it was a great, uh, great and wonderful thing. How would you, uh, Sadhguru? How was your experience in uh, on Everest? I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to say too. Oh yeah, like you know, it will take hours and hours to talk about Everest. But uh, you know, 2015, uh, uh, it was uh, like you know when we went, and the dream was almost like you know about to unfold, and we were about to give a shape to our dreams. And this earthquake happened in Nepal, and uh, we were about to reach to the base camp and was having our lunch at Gurukshet, and uh, the, the 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 dreams were just shattered and broken and crushed. Uh, like you know, and uh, so many people died in Everest uh, in in Nepal. Ten thousand people died in Nepal in that earthquake, and uh, more yes. than um, I think uh, twenty one people died in Everest. And uh, uh, it could shake anyone's confidence, like you know. So, but uh, uh, th that made me realize that uh, 
uh, yes, fear. I am not fearless, so uh, I, I got scared as well. But I tried to use that fear to my favor, and I went for that extra preparation. I went for that extra cautiousness, and uh, like you know, uh, and and it prepared my mind to face those kind of events. So when on the way to Everest, when I saw people falling off in front of me, dying, and like you know, when I could see someone uh, like you know waiting. Uh, to die, uh, like you know, and when you can, you have absolutely nothing else that you can do there, uh, yeah. uh, and like you know. So then I realized that how did I get that strength? And that strength came from all these difficulties and ups and downs of life that prepared me all the way for facing yeah. those things, facing those challenges. Because it, it creates a lot of mental pressure uh, yes. when you see someone dying in front of you, right? And, and still you have to move on, and like you know, uh, to the commitment towards the dream. Uh, and uh, I think that kept me ticking. But uh, just a question came to me after seeing Tina's question. Tina asked that, "What is the biggest fear you came across during climbing?" And uh, Emmanuel also said uh, in these lines, "What's daring for you?" So, uh, do you consider yourself fearless? Uh, uh, did ever any thought cross your mind that, "Oh my God, this is my age, and uh, can I do it?" I mean, did you have self doubt? Did you had what? What went in your mind? Both uh, this question is for both uh, James and Ted. Yeah, you know, no, of course I'm not fearless, but um, you can't, uh, you, 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 what, what you want to have is apprehension. What you want to do is be firing on all your cylinders. You want to be on your toes. You want to know all your senses have to be firing. You have to be able to see behind your head. You have to, you have to be hearing everything that goes on. Um, but fear will shut you down for sure. It shuts you down. If you, I've seen it before in mountains when somebody had fear when they, they, at a certain point where they just, fear overtook them, they couldn't go further. They, they had to stop and go down. Um, so apprehension is really good. It's important. It fires you up. It keeps you in the moment. It keeps you uh, aware of all the stuff that's going around you. Uh, but fear is something else. Uh, sure, I've, I've experienced fear. I mean, I was on Everest and I was, I was um, well, I have a bunch of stories on, but it happened to me over the years. Um, but, you know, as a, I mean, that'd take quite a bit of time to go into them. Uh, but fear is is, uh, is a tricky thing. So apprehension, uh, yeah, however you call it, you can call it a little bit of fear, a lot of fear, or whatever words you want to apply to it. But I call it apprehension. So apprehension is really good. Um, I had fear for uh, fear, I had moments of fear, but I was able to suck it, I guess, back. Um, you know, calm myself down um, and manage to continue on. I think you have to somehow um, um, be able to manage that situation uh, and, and continue to move on. Um, and by the way, if any, I, I, in India, if anybody does want to have the book, um, you since I don't uh, on the site, you can't go, you can't buy directly for India because of the the postal problem. But maybe if enough people, you know, uh, ten or people or more would like to have it, I could ship it in one uh, in one bundle uh, at some point. Right. I just add so, that in. So uh, to know more about the book, you have to go to uh, dare to uh, dare to reach dot ca, right? or and, or, uh, dare to reach, or dare to reach .com. So dare to reach .ca okay. is is my is a site about about is my site about me personally, and dare to reach .com is the book site. So either one, but dare to reach .ca right. is a good place to start. Right, and, and uh, you can, if you're interested, and I can organize it. Right. So it is priced at $75. And if you're interested, uh, uh, you can just contact me uh, here and then we can get uh, a lot from uh, a lot of books from uh, their shipped to India yeah. and then yeah. it would be cost effective. Uh, but it's a fabulous book and uh, it is done by one of the Slovakian artists. Uh, he has uh, uh, like you know, ensured that the book is the best of the best of the best mountaineering coffee table book. Yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Ted. And uh, before we come to another question here, so James, uh, uh, are you fearless? <laughs> uh, no, fearless. It's um, well these days. It's all about assessment of risk, um, and yes, apprehension comes into that. But yeah, once upon a time, I had fear. I remember when I started out in this game. Um, you, uh, in the in the UK, the, um, the the most serious mountains are those in Scotland. And uh, it's a subarctic uh, climate up there, particularly in winter, and you get regular uh, significant snowfall there. 
And uh, here, living in England, I used to look at uh, Scotland and thought, God, those mountains are never be able to do those because, um, yeah, they're, they're, it's too scary. Um, and I look back now and I wonder, hmm, there I was all those years ago thinking these mountains are scary and I take them in my stride now. Um, yes, once upon a time I had, had fear. And how do you overcome that fear? Well, the answer is um, knowledge, understanding, somebody to guide you, uh, somebody to men mentor you, gain that um, understanding and experience. And you then realize, having to use a certain phrase, dared to reach to that particular objective, um, that actually, why not? I can achieve that, I can reach that, and let's do that and let's move on to the next thing. Um, because, as I say, climbing mountains isn't about starting at the bottom and immediately finding yourself at the top. It's all about little steps, little steps of experience. Yeah. Steps. So, um, I remember uh, the other day you were talking about your first mountain ever. Uh, uh, what, what was your first thought after seeing those mountains? Um, well, yes, yeah, so looking at, at them in awe and wondering um, if anybody climbed them, and if so, why, and um, if so, how. And uh, yeah, so uh, in, in fact, those particular mountains I looked at are actually relatively technically difficult, um, and perhaps even me now. But um, there are certainly plenty of mountains around the world that. Uh, people with mo mo moderate skills, such as I would say I have, um, uh, are, are, yeah, are quite capable of doing. And it's all about understanding what experience you need and uh, putting it into practice and getting on with it, if you can. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh, like in from this uh, session, we also uh, like, you know, found out from your talk that Start small is also a foundation of uh, the big dreams. And uh, I can relate to my story. Like you know, when I started, my first climb was uh, uh, when like, you know, it was a small hill. And uh, it, it, it was uh, like, you know, and that also in Tamil Nadu in the southern si side, and it is not in the Himalayas, not in the Andes, not in the Alps. Uh, but that small mountain gave me, or that small hill gave me so much confidence. And it was so much yeah. liberating feeling uh, that you go and Come and uh, I absolutely agree with uh, Ted when he said that mountains are metaphors. Actually, we climb those uh, the the fears which are the self doubt, the inhibitions uh, which are there in form of mountains, and when we cross them uh, and we cross the mountains as well, like you know. So uh, yeah, it, it was a great takeaway uh, from both of you here. And we have some more questions. Uh, one question that even I thought of asking you has been asked by Arindam Saha. What is the key or routine uh, to you, you're staying fit because at the age of 70, having this fitness at the like at, at the end the age of uh, what uh, James is here now, uh, to keep that fitness uh, to go to the high altitude mountains like that. What is that secret sauce that you're using? <laughs> yeah, you know, I um, uh, I I try to do sports I like, I love, and I and I push myself hard on them. Particularly, you know, mountain biking. Uh, I do that. I go out for. Uh, uh, you know, three, three hours, four hours when I can, uh, sessions and I push hard, you know, um, we do, we do, we do good, good hills and so forth. So you just get your, get your cardio going. So make sure your cardio is good and strong. Uh, of course in the winter, uh, cross country skiing or, or snowshoeing and so forth. Uh, we have lots of that around here. we got lots of snow. Um, and, um, and then I do weights, uh, usually once or well, usually a couple of times a week about an hour and a half each session. So I try to, um, during these days, uh, I try to do a minimum of seven hours a week of intensive exercise. Um, when I'm preparing for a big mountain, uh, that I ramp that up into at least 10, 10 hours, 12 hours a week. So I think it's just a question of having a good balance type of, of um, uh, exercise and sports together. Uh, doing what you like, um, you have to like it. You have to love it. You have to really enjoy it. You have to feel, you know, you have to feel great when you're doing it. You have to feel, you know, you have to want to come back and do it the next time. So it's got to be some things that you enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think just doing that, I mean, on a constant basis, uh, pushing yourself. I mean, they talk about, you know, training now. You do five minutes and you're trained. I don't think so. I, I think you need to go out there and, and, uh, and, you know, do uh, short bursts of of uh, cardio, and then other times do do a long, progressive. You know, three, four hours of four 
or more, of course, of hiking on a, you know, on a keeping your heart rate at a, re at a reasonable level, but constant, you know. So you need all kinds of different things to keep your body, um, body fit. Um, but of course, it's your mind as well. You know, you have to be interested in stuff. You got to be enthusiastic. You gotta, you gotta want to, um, you know, see what's in you. So there's a, a whole bunch of different things. But physically, um, go out there and try do different things. Your sports, um, you know, weights. Weights are important, especially the older you get. Hmm. So one question from Soma Brother Banaji. What type of psychological preparations you take? You guys take? Jim had it. Uh, James had it uh, right when he says, uh, "One step at a time." You know, um, you learn a little bit at a time. You get more and more experience. Uh, the more experience you have, the more confident you are uh, uh, with yourself in what you're doing in the climbing. Uh, all three of us know that. I mean, all three can answer it exactly the same way. It's about starting somewhere and gradually. Uh, building up your experience, building up your self-confidence, uh, and building up your knowledge of of that sport, um, of whatever you do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ali says I said they get going. So Ali uh, was very inspiring. He just uh, did his Everest base camp, and uh, as he did the Everest base camp, uh, so I, I was lucky to take him with me for Everest base camp, and I could see the transformation as a person, the thought process, how it is changing in the whole expedition from where. The fear comes that I can't do it to that maybe I can do it and maybe I let me push harder. No, I don't want to give up. And then finally, when they do it, it's a kind of satisfaction and you never know the strengths that you have. Uh, and yeah. uh, uh, thanks, Ali, for uh, you know, being there. And I'm sure your next mountain is going to uh, call you very soon. So next question. And we are almost at the fag end of the uh, call. So Lisa uh, sends from, I think, uh, Montreal. No. Yeah. So do you practice meditation in order to build confidence and discipline? I'll take that, first of all. Um, I mean, the meditation, no, not as such, but um, my wife will confirm that I spend far too much time uh, researching before I go on my trips uh, because I don't want anything to surprise me. And that's all part of this risk mitigation. It's mm -hmm. uh, difficult to mitigate, but uh, the more information that you can gather, and the, uh, the better from my my perspective. Um, and uh, I would say I wouldn't call that meditation necessarily, but it, there's a lot of thought that does go into it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ted, you got one booking already for the book. Uh, so, of course, I wanted two books, and Arindam uh, has uh, needs one more book. And I can see Dipanjanda raising his hands from there. So yeah, Dipanjanda, one book for you as well. And uh, the first 20 books will be signed personally with a note from Ted. And uh, and we'll be also waiting for a book from uh, James. Uh, James, when are you writing your next book? <laughs> and you too, Satya, and you too. <laughs> yes, uh, like, you know, I'm so busy climbing, uh, Ted, like, you know, that I'm not finding time to uh, uh, write the books. Uh, so uh, you that's have a very interesting question. In front of you with all those prominent mountains, with all the mountains of prominence. You got a, you got a big job <laughs> in front of you there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one question that we have is, uh, have you had any discouragements uh, um, from Nandi, uh, Navanita? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yes. Uh, discouragement is a funny word. I, I, um, I mean, everybody, you know, you, you can't help but have things that go that, that go wrong, whether in you know in life, in business, or on the mountains. And um, I would say that um, you know, I can sleep it off. I can go to bed at nighttime, and the next morning I feel like I'm ready to go all over again. It's you know, I guess other people feel discouragement, I guess, in different ways. I, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, for me, I normally am able to, um, you know, uh, manage it. And, and it's, 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 a fun, it's a great question, actually, because it's not an easy one. Just to, It's not a black and white question. It's a lot of depth in that question. But for me personally, I normally can... Can just sleep it off. I can say I believe in what I'm doing, and uh, I know it's not. I knew it wasn't going to be 
easy when I started. Um, so I just have to believe in my decision I took to do what I'm doing, climbing the mountain or whatever, and I'm going to just keep pushing and pushing through. And, and, you know, I think that is so much to do with success anyways. It's just pushing through the barriers because, you know, everybody's going to face this hardship along the way, whether it's a mountain or anywhere. And you, you just got to keep pushing and, and believing and pushing. And um, normally, you know, it, it will come together when you, uh, you give it time and uh, you give it uh, the hard work and the, and the you know, the, the passion, you know, that you have to have. Um, but you can you can reach you know it's about daring to reach and and uh, you can do it I mean you can get over those barriers but you it's not easy it's it's one step at a time and it's believing and it's passion and um, all those things I think in the mix I would say yeah so uh, I I think what you told is absolutely absolutely. A basic necessity in mountains that you know we should have we cannot afford to have a dent also in our confidence when we are walking on on those uh, sharp ridge or when we are uh, crossing some sections which are like bound to like you know uh, pump our heart like that uh, so it's like unshakable uh, determination and uh, uh, unstoppable i think right and it, it's very important to know ourselves that what do we really want uh, uh, do we really want to go yes do you want to come back? Yes. And that voice should be only from within and not from around. I think uh, that's a great uh, thought process. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, listener has written, how do your families feel about you taking these life-threatening climbs? Uh, <laughs> is it life-threatening? I don't see as a life-threatening. <laughs> Driving is more life-threatening. <laughs> well, in my in my case, uh, Rosanna didn't, um, you know, lived with it and um uh, you know she she um uh, she, she uh didn't didn't push me out to do it but but at the same time she was able to live with it um however she did tell me one time uh not to do a mountain it was going i was going to climb uh lenin peak in in uh, kyrgyzstan Russia. Yeah. and and uh i um it's a story, so I won't get into all the details. But, but um, I, I have to admit that after uh, I did, I did start the climb. Um, before I got out of uh, base camp, there was a huge avalanche. Um, the day, the the the, the, the day uh, when I first arrived, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, I could hear it coming down from my tent. I looked out, there it was. Uh, I climbed the next day, and when I got into camp. Uh, camp one tucked up against a rock wall. Another huge avalanche came down, and I said to myself, "I think I think she's got a good point here." So I, <laughs> I got off the mountain. So uh, you know, listen to your listen to your your loved ones, uh, listen to your wife. But um, basically, uh, it's probably a little bit difficult for families. I I can imagine. And uh, James, yeah. well, take your family um, along with you for the climb. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a very understanding wife. I've managed to drag her up a few uh, moderately high mountains, um, pro 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 provide uh, a beach and some uh, cocktails uh, or a suitable reward afterwards. Um, I think. Well, my kids think. Uh, well, think I'm mad. Uh, <laughs> they don't understand uh, why. Um, but each to their own, I suppose. Um, and um, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't necessarily say they are life-threatening these um, these trips. Uh, there are risks. You have to understand them. You have to manage them. Um, and uh, whether it's an avalanche or a crevasse or rock fall or the technical terrain you're on that you might fall off potentially, uh, you you develop the skills uh, to identify those risks and deal, deal with them appropriately. Okay, there's, there's a residual risk that perhaps um, uh, you can't manage, uh, but fortunately I've avoided those. Uh, I had a close call actually last year um, on Mont Blanc because there's a particular notorious um, uh, couloir there called the Grand Couloir, and I was actually hit by a rock, fortunately. <laughs> rocks and that. But fortunately, there little ones. And it was early in the morning, and therefore it's only little ones that are coming down rather than big ones. So, um, despite having 
started to cross that cooler at six in the morning when everything should have still been frozen in. Nonetheless, um, you know, these things happen. Uh, and I got a bruise, but they couldn't stop me. And uh, there we are, these things happen. Yeah. Right. Awesome. So uh, yeah, by this time, we already have uh, good news for Ted. You got uh, Raju Shirai wants a book. Uh, Sandeep Nanda, Navanita Nanda, they want a signed book. Sunit Maiti uh, uh, wants a signed book. Subhita Dey wants a signed book. So yeah, I mean, like, uh, what can they expect from this book, uh, Ted? Well, it's it's, um, it's it's 198 pages. It's a beautiful bound book. Um, sewn. Uh, it, we did. Uh, the artist uh, was is um, from Croatia. He uh, he's a fantastic artist, um, and it's he put it together with a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of love and passion. So what's in it is basically about uh, our experiences of daring to reach. It's Emmanuel Dave is a co-author. We're two of us together. Uh, Goran, uh, well, Goran Hamzik is his real name, not Goran Go, but um, is the artist. And um, uh, Emmanuel and I um, have uh, just passion for mountains and passion for life. And and we wrote a book with uh, two front covers. One, uh, I'm on one side, he's on the other. Two, um, uh, and we meet in the middle, which is really cool. He's a different generation, much younger than me. Um, and um, we um, came up with this idea of just two, two cultures. Uh, he's French, I'm English, uh, younger, I'm older, two generations. Philosophies, two different philosophies. So it's about, anyways, it's about our stories in the mountains, about our stories in life. It's about how we um, manage to do what we've done and, and uh, it's about our screw ups. It's uh, um, where we went wrong, and and um, uh, it's about a lot of different things. In fact, um, and uh, anyway, by the way, if anybody does want the book, uh, it's going to be signed uh, by him and by me. And if they just write me a little bit of a story about themselves, I'll know how to tailor the special message to them inside the book. And what would be your email address, uh, Ted? So use the. Uh, I guess the best way to. Uh, get in touch with me is through dare to reach dot www dare to reach dot ca. Um, just leave me a note, and I'll be able. You know that'd be the best way I think to contact me that way there, and right. then we can figure out a, a shipping method and so forth. Right. So uh, we have um, actually uh, uh, a great audience uh, today. As I saw, uh, there were people like. Um, uh, uh, Professional mountaineers like Devabrata Mukherjee, uh, like you know, and uh, there are uh, there were uh, junior, like you know, uh, the very start up, starting kind of thing. Like you know, I can see Praveen, so who went with me for Everest Base Camp, and uh, I saw a huge transformation in his life, and like he is hungry for more now. Uh, like you know, and uh, then I have seen Nilavishek, who is already pursuing towards uh, a goal like that, and even then Dipanjan. Uh, whom I will bring right now. Uh, so Dipanjan has also, uh, like you know, did some small hills, uh, just like how I did. Uh, and the first hill happened to be the hill that I also went uh, for the first time. Uh, even uh, so, I, I think so. One last question that we are going to take is the uh, uh, okay. Uh, Praveen also wants a um, uh, wants a uh, book copy, and the last question. Uh, Second last question is Sandeep Nanda's uh, that, do you feel that too many number of mountaineering expedition is impacting the weather, especially global warming impact? And uh, the last question that we'll take is, uh, I saw one that, what do you see the future of climbing after this pandemic situation? I think very, very uh, good questions, these two questions. Anyone uh, want to take, take this up? Yeah, uh, okay. Well, there are lots of communities around the world that are dependent on the Climb, climbing for um, you know, as part, a part of their adventure tourism, uh, and a number of the countries in South America immediately come to mind for me. So I think they were probably quite keen that it should um, be resurrected. Um, uh, and uh, Kilimanjaro and um, the area around that is also highly dependent on many people who climb that mountain every year. Um, of course, there's a question of getting there. 
and how so the airlines are going to be uh, affected by um, the uh, lack of revenue that we're receiving at the moment and whether they'll go bust. Um, I think it will come back. Um, it may be quite slow uh, because I think there's the economic imperative locally to encourage um, tourism, adventure tourism, um, and obviously won't apply just to mountaineering, but it'll apply to other sorts of adventure tourism as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm moderately confident that um, it will come back to something like it was before, whether it be exactly as it was before, I don't know. But well, we all have mountains, uh, you know, within, uh, not a lot of us have mountains anyways within, uh, you know, um, not far away from where we live, for instance, hills or mountains or whatever. So we have lots of stuff to play with and organize ourselves with and practice on. Um, I don't know, nature isn't going to go out of uh, business because of, uh, of, of, of a virus, you know, and, and we're going to get back to normal. I mean, uh, we have a, uh, we have a term in Quebec here, it's, uh, ça va bien aller, means it's going to be okay, and uh, it will be okay. It takes some time, but we will get back into uh, um, the, the, um, you know the great world of nature and out about out in nature i think there's less issues anyways with um uh you know a virus but it's going to come back just give it time believe 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 yeah so uh even we see tulika also watching here so tulika uh from the army background and uh, she uh is one of those uh, leading women mountaineers from india who have climbed Everest. Uh, Thanks, Tulika, for watching. So, yeah, uh, so with that, uh, we end. Uh, so, Dipanjana, all to you uh, for the sure. ending note. Sure. Uh, um, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I think before we end, first of all, thanks for this lovely station. I mean, we learned a lot. It's uh, very yes. rare in this part of the world to, you know, meet uh, mountaineers from across the continent. Thanks once again. So the last question I think that all would have in mind is that what would be your parting note to the audience? You know, if you can go one by one, uh, probably James, I'll start with you. What would be your question, uh, you know, your comment about the audience and, you know, what is the message that you would, you would like to give to the audience? Um, well, th yes, thank you for, for watching. It's been a uh, fascinating discussion. And uh, I think the s simple thing is a belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Uh, adventure. Go out there and uh, um, experience it. Whether you know, don't be. Just go dare to reach. Go out there and 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 um, you know. I heard a great quote last night uh, from Bob Dylan. He said, uh, "We don't find ourselves. We create ourselves." Um, it says it all right there. You know. Uh, Go out there and, and make your life. Go out there and find your adventure. Go out there and just get started one step at a time. Just do it. Make it happen. Uh, whatever it is. And there's a million different types of adventure. Just go believe in yourself, like James said, and get it done. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I always believe in dreaming big and everything starts with a dream. Uh, and when you start dreaming from, uh, uh, like, you know, when the dream become an obsession, you know, that like, you know, you will be breathing yeah. the dream in and out, day in and day out. And uh, what happens next is the blood starts screaming. And uh, when, when, when you allow that to happen, then yeah. you and your dreams are not two different entities. That you become one and then you are your dream. So when you are your dream, there is absolutely nothing else that matters. And if you want to achieve something, I think the first and foremost thing that is to have the audacity to dream, to allow ourselves to dream that big. And then uh, the belief system takes it forward from there. So yeah, so that's my message. Uh, you got so, it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think, so, yeah, um, let's, yeah, let's not forget that today is Satya's birthday and you know, <laughs> We all wish him uh, all the best. Uh, I'm sure that Nagpur is just around the corner next year. But uh, yeah, so life life moves on. 
in this uh, pandemic times it's it's great to hear from all of you and have a whiff of positivity all around yeah, thank you thank you so much thank you so much james thank you so much dipanjan and most of all thank you to all the audience who had uh, take the who has taken the time to um, uh, like you know come for this session and uh, like you know do let us know if you like this kind of session then we will host this kind of session more with a uh, lot many more mountaineers and we'll get the philosophies of life and we will all uh, uh, go to the next level so thank you thank you and good night thank you bye okay good night